Hey, welcome to Live from America podcast. This is Hatem, along with Noam Dorman, the owner of the legendary comedy cellar, uh, New York City and Vegas. Uh, welcome, sir. And- <coughs> legendary is becoming better and better words since we may never open again. <laughs> it's all will- legends. No, no. It will stay cont- the, the legacy will continue. <coughs> And uh, we have Mr. Lou Perez, the head writer, producer, and comedian for we the, in the, we the Internet. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me. Good to see and, you. And the guest of honor, very, very, very um, good friend of us, and we love having him in the show. Because not only he's uh, good at what he does, but he's also really funny. So he, he brings a lot to the show. Mr. Rick Wilson. New York Times number one best-selling author, co-founder of the Lincoln Project, the infamous negative ad maker, <coughs> and President Trump's worst nightmare. Welcome, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show, sir. Adam, thank you so much for your kind words. I, uh, I, I, I like to think of myself as, as, as at least his, his, his nemesis. <laughs> oh, I mean, from his tweets, especially when you, when you post your ads. You know, no, I, I think he had. I think Trump said he had a dream about a Mexican family moving in next door, and then that became his. Word. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to keep them out of your white suburbs. I've heard. <laughs> well, uh, uh, so Rick, I want to ask you something. Every every election, we say this is the most important election in our lifetime ever. You've been mm-hmm. around for a long time. Do you think that this election really is the most important election of our lifetime? Well, I've been in professional campaign politics since 1988 when I was just out of school and a young guy. And I will tell you, there has never been a more consequential election than this one in our lifetime by, by any stretch. Nothing, is, nothing compares to a guy who has managed to fuck up the economy so, so that it's teetering on the edge of the Great Depression, a pandemic that we've lost more Americans that were killed in Vietnam, 9-11, World War II. I mean, nothing compares to it. And, and, and finally, nothing compares to an election where one of the candidates is saying essentially, I will cheat to win. He's saying it outright. I will cheat to win. I will use everything in my power to secure victory fuck the law, fuck the constitution, fuck American norms and institutions. He's going to do it. So that's why this is, this has the advantage of being true. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. So what would happen if he wins? What, what America would look like the next four years if he, if he wins again? Well, look, I think it starts looking an awful lot like, um, it starts looking an awful lot like Russia. It's a kleptocracy. It is a it is a family business. It is it is it has some of the trappings of a small d democratic system, but none of the realities of it. Uh, okay. So the last time we talked, we we, we we were asked, and I know you don't. You, you always said I don't want to pick and be picking the Democratic uh, nomination, but uh, we agreed that Joe Biden would be the best to help you do your job. Now with Kamala Harris, what what do you feel? Look, I think she is a, a, a of the field of people that look. He said he said a, a boundary set of conditions. He said he was going to pick a woman, and he indicated he was going to pick uh, uh, an African American woman. And I think of the of the of that universe that he chose from, Harris has a lot of skill sets that he will need. Look, the the main thing about a, a Democratic or a Republican vice presidential candidate is the is the rule of do no harm, and. And I don't think she does any harm to the Democratic ticket. I think she brings a lot of energy from African-American women who are a core constituency of the Democratic voter turnout model. Um, I think she brings a lot of energy and, and poise to the ticket. And, and I think one of the reasons Biden picked her is look, he's been around public life a long time. He's been around debates a long time. Um, and he respects somebody who can land a good punch, even if it's on him. She landed a couple of good punches on Joe Biden in the campaign. And mm-hmm. so he came out of this thinking, you know, who do I want to have who could go out and brawl with, um, with, with, you know, the, the, the Trump world? Who do I think, who do I want that can go out and get up in Mike Pence's grill and really fuck with him when he's on stage? Um, 
and she fits those those measures i think better than a lot of the other people that were on the list i think there were some folks that that had some dangers um of letting the trump people you know turn them into distractions <clears throat> but harris is um and she look and she survived round one of their attacks on her uh and they haven't been able to do a knockout punch yet and they've got a lot of stuff in their whisper campaigns but i think she's doing pretty well so far for considering it's 24 hours in what about her can, can, can i say can i say some things I, I want to, uh, I have a, a sketchy internet connection here because apparently Trump is in charge of Maine uh, uh, internet, but um, <laughs> if, I, if I go in and out, like, I don't know, put up a finger or something, Hot Tim, if I'm okay. not coming to. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that I'm, I, I reverberate a lot with a swing voter. And let me tell you where I'm, where I'm coming from. And you tell me, uh, and, and that's not to say that I'm supporting Trump. I'm not. But I could see how someone like me is in a real bind right now. Um, I own a business and we came within this close to being looted. My mayor uh, stood down the police. I see police standing down all over the country. I saw a media as for as long as they could try to deny that what I was seeing with my own eyes wasn't true. Now we have <clears throat> mayors all over the country protesting, including de Blasio, protesting the police. Let's take de Blasio. He's, been, he's protesting the police that he's been in charge of for seven years. Like it's, it, it's like we're being gaslit. If, if like you're in charge of the police, if you thought changes needed to be made, you don't need to go out and protest. You could have done it in the last seven years. It's like me going out and protesting the bad service at the comedy cellar. It's like, dude, you're in charge of the comedy cellar. You're not the one who you're protesting yourself. <laughs> so uh, I see cancel culture just growing and growing. I, I guess what I'm saying is that all the real threats to me, like the real threats, the things that I'm worried about in my life, which is not if taxes go up a little or down a little, I'm worried about violence. I'm worried about a, a norm of content of your character for my children who are a mixed race. I'm worried about um, rule of law uh, that I, and I'm, and I'm worried about cancel culture. I'm worried about saying the wrong thing and not being fired. And Biden, I think ran away with it because he presented a picture that he was still a liberal who would identify with the things I'm saying. The Biden is 78, and now he picked a vice president who was soundly rejected by the liberal Democratic primary system, soundly rejected. She dropped like a stone, treacherously called him racist. And I'm like, well, if, he, if Biden drops dead on January 19th, we're going to have a president who is very, very sympathetic to all the real threats in my life. I mean, I'm glad that she's pro-choice, but, and I'm glad that she might, you know, stand for trans rights, which I agree with, but like my actual life, no, she, that, the stuff that she is under the sway of, whether she believes it or not, it, I find very, very, very threatening. And let me just say one other thing, and I'll shut up. And, and I'm having trouble with this. And I, uh, Vox.com, a close examination of Harris's record shows that she fought to keep people in prison after they were proved innocent. Fought to keep people in prison after proved innocent. New York Times. Harris fought tooth and nail to uphold wrongful convictions that have been secured through official misconduct, including evidence tempering, false testimony, suppression of prosecutors. Uh, in the Atlantic, she says very little of nothing convincing about some of the most serious charges against her, like she fought hard to keep innocence in prison. And it goes on and on. This is not from Breitbart or Fox News. How at a time of Black Lives Matter or any time are we elevating someone to vice president who kept innocent people in prison and also fought to prevent a man on death row, likely innocent, from getting a DNA test? Why is this not, why is this okay? It, no, okay, can I just, can I just say something? Yeah. It, I, I think it really, you know, it really speaks for the times where it's almost like the identity politics becomes more important than the actual um, actions of the person um, who's, you know, being, uh, being nominated where, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously Biden said he wanted a, you know, a, a woman of color where it's, where it's sort of like, you know, on that front, yeah, she's great. 
but man, well, that history Lou, that she has. Let, yeah. let me tell you what I, what, I, what I see, when I see them do that, and listen, I understand now it's a binary choice. They may want to vote for the ticket anyway, but it, it wasn't a binary choice when, when Biden chose her. He could have chosen Susan Rice or if, he, if, he, if the content of your character party now decides that they have to have a strict quota system for vice president. But, um, you know, I say, what do they take me for? It wasn't that long ago that I was told that Trump University was disqualifying, that, uh, you know, various uh, levels of misconduct, even children, incarcerating children in cages, which, you know, I, I was very much against. But I understood, well, they, they come over, you can't have, you can't allow families to just say, once, once you touch down in America, you're free to go. So they can't do that. So they incarcerate them together. Then the Civil Liberties Union appeals and there's a court decision which says you can't incarcerate them together. So they're stuck incarcerating the children separate from the parents, including under the Obama administration. And I, what I would do is just ignore the court ruling and force it up to the Supreme Court. I would incarcerate them all together. But at least I understand the process of how you backed, we got backed into a situation where we were doing something as horrible as incarcerating children. But I cannot understand anybody who ever fought to keep an innocent person in prison, period. I'm not backing off. I don't care if the entire world gaslights me. That is pure evil. And for a party that's concerned about Black Lives Matter, to pretend that this didn't happen just means that they don't mean anything. They are Machiavellian as anybody else, and they will, they will twist and work backwards from any outcome that they want. And you, you will, I mean, it's just... If, if you strung together five stories of prosecutors who were ignoring evidence of innocence and put them into a documentary and named the documentary Profiles in Evil, nobody would question the title. This is the worst. This is Fidel Castro shit. And they don't say she didn't do it. She doesn't even, I mean, it's, it's just, it's hands off. We're not allowed to talk about the fact that she fought to keep innocent people in prison. But of course, she's, she's on the right side of some issues now. So somehow that's supposed to matter it doesn't matter so i don't i don't i, I don't know how explain it to me rick i don't know well I, i'm not familiar with the details of the specific case you're referring to there's a number um, of cases uh, yeah. Yeah. but i will say this she led a uh, you know as a as the attorney general of a state there are a lot of things that are happening in every in every prosecution body in this country there are there are things like that that are happening for procedural reasons and for bad reasons and for good reasons and for a whole host of things. So I'm not dismissing what you're saying because look, I, I was one of the earliest people in what's called the right on crime movement, which has a lot to do with over sentencing and disproportionate sentencing for African Americans and minorities um, and, and, and prosecutorial misconduct, all those things. Those things may all be very, very valid questions. Um, at the end of the day, um, I, I think that the that the assessment that 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 Lou made will end up being, you know, where why we're at where we're at. There are a lot of reasons why she's a better identity fit, a better political fit, and there are calculations that are made in every campaign that are not just you know uh, about every detail of somebody's history. I mean, look, look, Mike Pence was a lobbyist for cigarette companies and, and no, as, 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 as little as 10 years ago was writing letters, writing, writing uh, uh, reports saying that cigarette smoking is healthy for you. He fucked up the AIDS crisis in, in Indiana so bad it, has, it was one of the largest outbreaks of HIV in the country in the 2000s. So, you know, everybody's got shit in their record. Everybody's got, you've got things in their record. But this is a calculus in a race that is about Donald Trump. This is a race, politically speaking, and set everything else aside, it's still a political campaign about whether or not Donald Trump is going to be president for four more years. But Rick, hold on, hold on. But Rick, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying again, like I'm a, I'm a swing voter. Let's, let's, say I'm, let's say I'm the voter who voted for Obama, then switched to Trump, and now you want me to switch back to Biden. Now, presumably, if I switch from Obama to Trump, there's a lot of it could be because I don't like this PC stuff. I don't like the, 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 uh, the identity politics. I don't, I, don't, I don't like all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not on board with the woke. Um, you're, Listen, I, 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 you're, you're not going to get a defense of, of, yeah. of woke cancel culture from me. Although I will tell you this, as a, as a, as a public opponent of Donald Trump, 
the number of th times people have tried to cancel me now from the right, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I might, I, the, the list is long and undistinguished, but it's disgusting. It's, yeah, it, it's, I it's absurd. It's absurd. But, but yeah, so you're not going to get a defensive from me of, of woke culture or, you know, you, you know, oh but, my God, this guy, this guy misgendered someone, someone's pronoun. He has to be fired and then Rick, thrown into a Rick, jail. Rick, you know? Rick, Rick, it's, it's not just the defensive war culture. It's like, okay, so when it was convenient, like a year or two ago, we kind of came to a consensus on the left that Bill Clinton uh, uh, got away with murder when he was not literally murder, you know, that we, we were too easy on Bill Clinton. We should have taken Juanita Broderick seriously. Uh, Gillibrand is sorry that he wasn't impeached. And, um, just to show you how serious we are, we're going to make Al Franken resign. Now, Clinton apparently is rehabilitated when it doesn't matter. And now he's going to speak at the convention. Kamala Harris, I mean, you, you can slice it and dice it any way you want. But let me tell you something. If your child was kept in prison and the prosecutor knew that she was innocent, I mean, the, the, the way you're going to perceive that level of evil is not in the universe of lobbying for cigarette companies. It's just not. Well, here, here, look, if you want to talk about a universe of evil on March no, 13th, I want to talk White only House, about Kamala Harris. Uh, uh, look, uh, this is a political comparison. And, and so I, I don't want to make a comparison. I'm trying to understand. Uh, I, look, I, I get I'm your point. No, I, I know. I totally get your I, I totally get where you're your headed. Own standards. I, I totally get where you're headed, but that's not how politics works. You, you, your standards, you're, 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 you're only trying to hold the other team to their standard, okay, in politics. That it is the ultimate, you know, sophistic uh, argument. And it's not about, you know, we, we, people who go out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold myself to the standards the other guy sets for me, always lose. And so, you know, Biden has a war to fight that is a war specifically and exclusively about Trump, his administration, his execution, his philosophies, his failures. And all election, all re-elections are a referendum on the incumbent. That's where the oh, judgment right. comes. So and the most, when, and by the way, and hang on one more second. Vice presidents almost never do anything positive or negative to the overall ballot test of the ticket. We've researched the shit out of it over the years on both sides. It almost never does anything good or bad. Rick, and, Rick. And so Harris, you, it, look, Harris's record as a, as a prosecutor and a tough cop and all that, to be honest with you, probably plays better than you expect in a lot of communities you might not expect. Rick, Rick, because, because the New York Times is not at this point going to do a deep dive and, and really talk about the innocent people or exonerator, the innocent people kept in jail. But don't you understand, at some point, people are smarter than we give them credit for, and they do look at this and say, what do they take me for? It was just last year they told me that Kavanaugh, with real tears in their eyes, hysterically crying that Kavanaugh at 16 shit based groping at a woman and then rolling over onto the bed he was disqualified 30 years later he was disqualified now we find out that Kamala Harris using the full power of the police state is fighting to keep innocent people in prison as a full grown adult with ambition and we say uh we, we have an answer for that we, and I'm so say, but you really meant it about Kavanaugh, right? That wasn't politics. You really meant it. You were really outraged. I'm like, no, you're all both sides, both parties. You're all full of shit, and it's corrosive as hell because because Broken everything. Welcome to politics, sold, though, man. I, 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 well, yeah, but I'm just telling you as a voter. I mean, everything everything is sold to me on principle, and at some point, if neither side ever ever shows any care about this principle, I realize. It's all bullshit. So, so you know what? Why shouldn't I just vote what's best for me? What do I fucking care about their principles that they're selling me? I care about protecting my business, making sure the cops are there when I need them. I pay more than 50% of my income in taxes as it is. That's, I've done my part. And you know what? And whatever, however evil the president is, if, if Trump ripped people off or he's a racist, is a racist worse than someone who keeps innocent people in prison? Ah. Eh. I don't know. I could go. I could go either way on that. On that comparison of morality, I'm saying you know, stand up for something and stick to it. She, Biden could have chosen Susan Rice, who I disagree with on everything, but she's a competent, first in her class, Rhodes Scholar, and, uh, clearly uh, uh, was ready to take office on day one. And I would, and I would say, well, yeah, I, that's you know, I, I just don't agree with her on certain partisan issues. But how can I argue with her being qualified right. for president? Right. Instead, right. Right. prosecutor. Who, who had an incompetent prosecutor's office. Um, and again, and I'll shut up. 
This is the Atlantic, Vox.com, and New York Times who are saying these things. Imagine what Breitbart would say if they, if they did an investigation. Okay, I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> Rick, who would you choose to be a vice president in, in your opinion? Honestly, I, I, if, if, if I were in that position, mm -hmm. I, would have, I would have personally chosen Tammy Duckworth. Military okay. veteran, lost her legs in a helicopter crash, mom, funny, smart as shit. That would have been my personal choice. But again, not my job to do it. And I've got a lot of other like bad judgment in my life, I'm sure. Yeah. So, you know, um, <laughs> okay. but I think, I think Duckworth would have been a, a, a terrific choice. Also, she's from the part of the world that you want to make sure that you're, you're really working pretty hard. That's actually a great, great uh, choice, I think. Uh, all right, let's, let's move on a little bit. So the debates now that's coming up. You, you work with, you trained um, different, on different levels, presidential, Congress. I've, right? I've done debate training for, for, for presidential races, for vice presidential uh, races, for senators, governors, congressmen, dog catchers, everything up and down the spectrum. <laughs> you, you know, if, if, Trump, if Trump says something along the lines of what I'm saying in a debate, it would ring very, very strongly to a lot of people. Go ahead, Hatem. Yeah. So, so Rick, what, what would you um, train Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, again? Because Trump is funny and he's, he have a lot of presence. He's an, he's an actor, you know? Look, Trump is a, yes, Trump is an actor. He is a guy who understands where the camera is. He understands how to use his physicality on the stage in, the, in a debate. And look, he hovered behind Hillary deliberately. <laughs> he lurked up behind her like a fucking Frankenstein monster, like, like looming out of the darkness coming up behind her. Reminds because me he, of Jurassic Park, remember? Right. <laughs> Little tiny hands. <laughs> <laughs> Clever girl. And, and I'll um, say Al, Al Gore tried the same thing and it backfired on him. Remember well, I was, I, I was actually at, no, I was at that debate and... And, you know, Al Gore's a big, tall guy. And W is maybe, I'm my height, maybe like 5'10 or something, six foot maybe. And I remember watching, I was off stage, like catty corner off stage, and I saw Gore drift out from behind his podium and start walking over to W. And you guys are going to miss this on, on podcast. But W steps out from behind his podium, just like rocks his shoulders back. He looks it up and he kind of cocks his head a little bit. And he's got this like fuck you grin on his face. It's like, you want to take another step, pud knocker? Because I'll knock your dick in the dirt. <laughs> I mean, you heard that. You could see the fucking Texas coming off the guy in waves, right? And, it was, and everybody backstage was like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm in Kenny Bunkport, by the way. As I love speak. that. Oh, it's beautiful. So how I love Kenny Bunkport. How is somebody like Bloomberg with all his money couldn't be trained? Billionaires believe that their skill set at making money and being billionaires is universally applicable to all things. And, and this is a thing I tell, I tell these guys when I'm debate portraying them. I'm, I'm like, look, I'm a pilot. I have a lot of hours. I've flown a lot of different kinds of airplanes. I'm a good pilot. But I am not a fighter pilot. And if you put me in the, back, in the front seat of an F-22 or an F-35 and say, Rick, go fly this plane around – I could probably fly it. I could probably do it. But there's also a big chance I'm going to screw it up and like be a smoking hole in the dirt. And that's what happens. I've done this with a lot of corporate CEOs for speech training and for legislative testimony training and for you know, people in, in, in an elected office. And they think about, when, especially the richer they are, the more convinced they are that they, can't, they don't need to do any of the training things. It's like why Mark Zuckerberg goes in front of Congress and you're like, you're not thinking, like, oh, there's a young tech CEO. You're thinking, this is an android from the future here to he kill us all. He doesn't even know how to drink water. Right. <laughs> he, he's, he's so disturbing because they won't take the training. Everybody should do debate training. Everybody do should do speech so, and debate prep. So what, would you, what would you train Biden for? Stay on, target on, stay on target on making this a referendum about Donald Trump every day. Stay on target. Don't let Trump play the physicality game. Because Trump will try to come over and, and hover over Biden like he did with Hillary. I would counsel any presidential candidate uh, on, in the, against Trump to, if he starts to, to like lurk around you or hover around you, touch him. Put a hand on him. Touch his arm. Touch his hand. And say something like, are you okay, Donald? You, you seem a little unsteady. Are you all right? You need me to hold you up here? Is there something <laughs> wrong? Mm -hmm. You've got you to fuck back with this guy. And you've also got to, like, when he interrupts you, 
the trick of Trump's interruptions is he expects that the the person he's interrupting will appeal to the moderator to play by the rules. Trump doesn't give a fuck about rules. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a he doesn't give a two shits about rules. So when he does something like that, you've got to wheel back and go back at him and say, Donald, fuck you. Here's how it is. Now, uh, and don't don't do the things of I'm reclaiming my time to speak. How dare you interrupt me? None of that. You go right back on message, and you get right back in his shit. And you say things like, Donald, listen, I know you have ADD. I know you're like a fucking child, and you can't focus for thirty fucking seconds. However, here's the point I'm making. You know, you've got to you've got to always go back to the to the things that disturb Trump, and the thing that disturbs him most is being a star and taking the camera away from him. Being in the picture, doing something more interesting and appealing and visually compelling than he's doing. You know, Rick, um, you're, you're so. Uh, I'm sorry, Lou. You want to say something? Yeah, I was. I was just going to say. You know, um, uh, I think Biden. You know, five years ago, I think could be trained to do exactly what what you're talking about. Um, but you know, it, it, it saddens me to see the footage of him. You know, stumbling over stuff, and you know, I do worry if it's. If we are watching someone who's you know losing their faculties, um, you know. So what? Do you, how do you? What do you do with well, that? Well, you know, uh, there's an awful lot of that out there in the ecosystem. That is, you know, the the not just the Fox ecosystem. Is that that's a storyline that's been pushed very very hard on Biden. Mm -hmm. I've seen him give plenty of presentations and speeches. I mean, look, he was great with Harris yesterday. He was on point the whole time. It wasn't staged. It wasn't teleprompted. It was you know Joe being Joe. And sometimes he's loose and weird and has his little verbal ticks and, and, and Phillips and hiccups and all that stuff. But I don't think Joe Biden is, is incipient dementia case, you know, as president. I think you could make an argument that there's a lot more physically and mentally wrong with Trump than you can with Joe Biden. Um, and, and, and yes, old dogs are hard to teach, okay? And he would have been hard to teach five years ago, too not because of any diminishment of capacity, but because he'd been vice president twice and a senator been reelected to the Senate five times or whatever it was and been through the rodeo. You, you, um, know, you, yeah. you just brought, so, brought up something that that's a good point where I wonder if, you know, if the media that I'm consuming is pushing that and really just putting a spotlight on the times when he messes up, you know, speaking as opposed to Rick, taking it Rick, as a whole. Rick, can I add something into that? Yeah. So, um, and I, I've never push the Joe Biden as um, having dementia thing ever. I've always kind of defended him, although I do recognize that it's possible, but he, he did very well in the one-on-one -on -one against Biden, uh, against uh, Sanders. I noticed that. Yeah. And I didn't see yesterday's thing, but I want to tell you something interesting. Maybe this will be helpful to you. I don't know if it's true or not, but I had a, a psychologist on, the sh on one of the shows and she told me that there is a actual phenomenon that as people get older, their speech impediments can reemerge, which right. has absolutely nothing to do with uh, dementia. However, what it does do is that it, it, it takes up their bandwidth. And as they're focusing on trying to get the word out, then they might say the, uh, stumble on, say the wrong thing because, you know, you're, you know, we've all been there. You're, you're thinking about something else and then something comes out like reflexively. It's not right. And I, I think, I mean, that, that, that had a big impression on me when I was told that. And I see for now after that, whenever I saw him, I said, well, maybe just having that elderly reemergence of speech impediment. So I think that's actually would be helpful to him to if people knew that that was a real thing. I don't know how you get that out. But. You know, the, Biden having having grown up with a stutter, yeah. um, I spoke to a woman the other day who was a speech pathologist and a, and a, and a psychologist. And she said, she says, it does happen that the, the, it sometimes childhood speech impediments come back in in seniority and in, in later years um and i've i've seen some of the trump people teasing around the edges of that to try to blame it on dementia when it's probably that when, when the when the you know occam's razor it's probably is what it is it's, it's probably an actual you know recurrence but i also think there's a big downside to that because something like 8 million kids have, or 8 million people in this country have had or had a stutter growing up. It's one of those things I think they could easily fuck it up because the Trump campaign, you know, these are the people, it's, it's what I call the hot sauce problem in campaigns. 
you want a little bit of hot sauce in your campaign. You want some things that are exciting and edgy and transgressive, but because everybody loves a little hot sauce. Nobody eats hot sauce by itself whole all the time. And, and I think Didn't they- Hillary Clinton? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought you were referring to Hillary carrying hot sauce around with it. Um, but it, it is, it's certainly something that I think is, um, is problematic for, um, for, 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 for the Trump campaign if they overdo it. So yeah, but I'm thinking if Biden gets up in that debate and he stumbles, uh, it would be helpful if somehow people understood that yeah, we don't I, know that like that actually, you know, that's, that's common for older people. It means nothing about his, uh, what's really going on in his head. Right. And, and look, yeah. knowing, knowing that Trump basically cannot read, um, or either cannot or will not read. And, and as I mean, he lives completely in a bubble made out of television shows in his head. Um, I think that there's a lot about, you know, the, the mental construct of Donald Trump, that even if Joe Biden's, you know, lost a gear up top, that there's still a greater risk factor with a guy who believes everything he sees on the curvy couch on Fox News in the morning and judge and judge and judge box of wine at night when she's yelling at the camera. So, so let me, let me give you a little focus group reaction I just had, but maybe it's interesting to you. Um, when you said Trump cannot read. Mm hmm. I, I, I didn't like that. I, I reacted negatively to that as I think a swing voter might. When you said he refuses to read, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's, he's not responsible enough to take okay. the time Good to point. read. You know? Yeah, yeah. But to, to, to the, to the, the, the cannot read is red meat to the people who hate him already. The refusal to read is like, yeah, we really need a president who's going to take the time to read. You know, so I just, for just, that's exactly how I reacted in real time. Uh, no, uh, no, you know what? I'm always listening to that sort of thing, and I, that's, yeah. a good, that's a good note. Yeah. So, so uh, Rick, I, I of love course the, he can read. I've seen him read. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I love, I love the, the title of your book, you know, uh, Running Against the Devil, A Plot to Save America from Trump and Democrats from Themselves. So how we can, because I feel like it's more if we lose, or it's going to be the Democratic Party that lost, the reason that lost, not because Trump went. You know, so how do you save them from themselves? Well, I mean, the, the book outlines a lot of things that I, that, that, that to my great satisfaction, when I wrote the hardback, you know, we were in the middle of the primary. Um, and I was very worried that they would end up turning the race into a policy debate. It didn't become a policy debate. I was very worried they would end up, you know, that Bernie Sanders would end up surviving the grind and becoming the nominee. Uh, didn't happen. And, and, I, and I, I outlined this in the book, and I said this a lot, and I said this in a, a million speeches. Biden is the best case scenario in terms of, of established name ID, um, association with the most popular Democratic president in, since FDR, um, and, 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 and the whole host of other things about the way he connects with, with middle and working class voters because of his own origins and background, he's the best case scenario. And so I'm really happy that they've, that they've sort of managed to get to the point that they're at right now. And the trick between now and election day is twofold. One, They've got to ratchet up their turnout operations and make sure, especially that African Americans come out, and they've got to make sure that they hold on to those suburban Republicans, those moderate Republicans who in 2018 walked away from the GOP and have continued to sort of stay out there outside of the Trump sphere. Um, but I, I, the additional stuff that I put in the paperback version is, is essentially reflective of the crisis we're in now with COVID. There's a, you know, I, I wrote it during the early stages of COVID, but it certainly, I knew it would affect the campaign as it, as it rolled out. And, and frankly, I, I, in the, the, some of the new materials, given the Democratic Party props for once, that they resisted a lot of their urges um, to scratch ideological itches and then said they focused on the, on the, the real political nut of this problem. Do you think so, that COVID so right. affected negatively or positively? Trump negatively the campaign oh ne no look, COVID has killed him we know from voter research that 65 percent of the people who say that they're they've changed their vote from Trump to Biden say so because th they, they say that Trump blew up uh, screwed up the COVID crisis so, so Rick let me let me uh ask you this so you, you know how Barry Weiss said that Twitter had become the executive editor of the New York Times yeah yep. famous quote and I think that Twitter's become the executive editor of everything, including backyard conversations that I've had. And, and this is- what, what, Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. And, and so what I'm getting at is that you talk about suburban voters. 
if if the Democrats were very, very clear about, look, Black Lives Matter is a cause to protect injustice to innocence and looting and vandalism and violence is also an, inju an injustice to innocence and we 100% stand behind free protest, but we're not gonna make any excuses for what we've seen in the cities and the protests. If, if, they could, if they could get themselves to utter that word, those words, they would win by a landslide. That's all the, if the suburban voters are worried about anything, that's all they're worried about. And he doesn't need to run up the score in California and, and New York. Not that anybody, I mean, they could, they well, could, I don't think that would suppress black vote, but the swing states, we just want to hear, I just want to hear a president say that, no, I don't agree with uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, that property can be replaced. Because as I said on this show before, what took 50 years to build can be destroyed in 15 minutes. And, and I sure. said, give me, I, I told somebody in anger, I said, give me a match and access to Hannah Nicole Jones' apartment, and I'll make a conservative out her overnight. I mean, like, what the <laughs> fuck? You think well, you, you know, can, I, I, and I so, think, yeah. And so angering to a, to a suburban voter. It's like, I'm try tired of people, like, I respect, I respect the movement to, against police brutality. I'm like, it's horrible. I don't want to see innocent people. I don't want to, I want to see, I want to see cops stop treating people with arrogance. Forget about the physical abuse, which is bad enough. Just the way they talk to people. But you know what? Don't make excuses when they want to burn down my building. Like that, that's, or, or you know, it's crazy. Uh, how, why can't the, why the Democrats speaking with a mouthful of mud on this stuff? Can't you speak clearly about it to us? Well, it's Biden, wrong? Biden was very clear right off the bat that the defund the police message was, was unacceptable. He has also said that, that non-peaceful protesting is unacceptable. Um, and so, you know, but I think there's also a thing here where you don't want to fall into two things. One is, is the predicate that suburban voters are focused on rioting and looting. Um, we've done a lot of polling of suburban voters. We've done a lot of research on suburban voters. And the number one, two, three, four, five, six, down to like 25th issue is COVID or economy. The, the rioting and BLM stuff is down in the low single digits as a most important problem. And I, by low single digits, I mean like 3%, 2%. Um, but it is, it is important for the optics of the, of the campaign, of the optics of the country, that if people want to see really fundamental change, they're not going to get it through Donald Trump. And so maybe not burning shit down is a good idea for a couple of weeks. And look, and Portland is a very, Portland is a couple of block radius that is a magnet for every fucking TV camera in the universe. And these people that are doing it in Portland, they're not helping their cause or Joe Biden's cause. They're helping Donald Trump. They're, they're, right. they are working, they're working every day, essentially, whether they know it or not, to, to elect Donald Trump again. Yeah. And yeah, but, 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 but wait, but wait, but, but what I see, what I, but the way the the way the mayors are reacting to it, I mean, I understand what you're saying about the suburban voters. Right now, COVID crowds everything out, and they blame Trump for that. And that might be enough to put Joe Biden in office all by itself. But as as an issue which appeals generally to law-abiding middle class people, and I I have to say, I don't I don't think it's just white people. I, I mean, I, no. live on a, I, I live on a street with, with Indian people, Asian people, and black people in, in, in Westchester. And I don't think they're any more sympathetic to having their businesses or whatever it is uh, uh, vandalized that, than I am. And I, and I think they very much support the, you know, the, the cause of ending police brutality. I just, I, and I think that seeing these mayors having so much obvious trouble just calling this for what it is. By the way, you know who was, who was very eloquent about it was Ilhan Omar. I don't know if you saw that clip. I mean, I, I, did I, not. I was cheering for her. Like, she won my heart. And this is a woman, you know, who I, who I have serious problems with for the reasons you could, uh, you could stereotype me and predict. But when she them. spoke against the violence in, in, with no hedging, I was like, wow, you know, I got to give it up to this woman. I, like, I, I, want a, I want a leader who talks like that. She really had me. So you should look up that quote. It was amazing. I'll check it out. Yeah. Check it and, out. And, and, to, and to Norm's point, Rick, you said something very interesting last time in the show. You said that 
Democrats need to like in a, in, a, in a state like Florida, you need to stop talking about guns because people like their guns there. So you need to know your audience. That was a great point for you know for for both set. Yeah, um, and look, I, one point I make in the book is that, and then and you know this is kind of what we're talking about with them. Uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, they are not woke. The most progressive Democrats in those states are to the right of, of moderate Democrats in California, New York, Massachusetts. Those mm. states are full of Democrats who guys like me used to convince to vote Republican. So if, if you're in Ohio and you're a, you're a progressive Catholic and you believe in social justice, um, but you're also pro-life, there's at least a vector for Republicans to make an argument there. You're a male Democrat in North Florida, and you may be a Democrat in all these other ways, but you love guns because you're in North Florida. You're a, you're, a, you're a deer hunter in Michigan, and you're a union male union worker with a high school education, and you hear that you, know, you, hear that you're, you, that you, you could lose your job if you use the wrong gender pronoun. There's an opportunity space for Republicans to exploit. And guys like me used to be very, very good at it. Yeah. And, and the Democrats need to be, they need to understand that, that making this a referendum on Trump's failures is a pathway for them to not have to talk about stupid shit. Yeah. yeah so, I wonder, um, um, uh, Charles, uh, like Charles Stephanie. Cook at National Review, National Review has brought up how so much of local politics has become nationalized. Sure, where, absolutely. Where, you know, some dumb shit mayor of a town of, you know, 5,000 does something stupid, and yep. now they become the embodiment of whatever party that they belong to. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and I'm, I'm in New York, so, um, like, uh, so my mayor is de Blasio. And it's like, so you have, a, a, you know, a Democratic mayor quoting Karl Marx, and... People can focus that and say, like, well, obviously that means Biden has to be, you know, a part of the uh, the Bolsheviks, something like that. And I really wish, I really wish that uh, I don't know if there's any way back for it, and then um, back to, uh, you know, just a better way of of interpreting this stuff, you know, and saying that you know the parties might actually be a lot more nuanced than just you know, right? Republican well, I, yeah. So yeah. I, I, guess, I guess Rick, if you were in the other team. You would have destroyed the Democratic Party now from all the mistakes that they've been doing, in a way. Am I right? Well, the the people around Trump in the campaign, they're not stupid, but they have a disadvantage in the is insofar as they work for somebody who would not let them run an actual campaign. Okay. Mm. And and that is a handicap on them. They will try to do some of the things we used to do, but there's also a big overlay right now that, you know, all the elections that we've been through, I'm going to say with the exception of 2002 and 2008, because in 2002, we were in the post 9-11 window and the country was still very different. 2008, we were in the financial collapse. Every other election I've been involved with since 1988 has largely been fought out in that homeostatic balance in the sort of mushy middle of American politics. But right now, there's been this big externality of COVID and the economy crashing that make using those tricks less effective. And if the Democrats can resist falling for those tricks, you know, and, get, and keep going back to COVID, back to Trump, back to the real thing, uh, I think they have a better than average chance of pulling this off this year. So how many states are in play right now, you think? Wait, wait, before you do that, can I, can I ask you a question? I sure. Think, um, you know, you know what I find myself going back and forth between? I feel like it would be good if either party lost. Meaning, like, both these parties really need to be taught a lesson. The Republicans need to be taught a lesson for backing a, a guy who was, you know, was, was um, Evil dipshit. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, unhinged and, and um, incompetent and, um, you know, just not up to the job. Right. And, and, and selling their soul and, and twisting themselves into pretzels to deny that he's lying when he's lying. And then all this stuff that, that we find difficult to swallow. So that would be great if he lost. Right. It would also be great if the Democrats lost because I would like to see them. I'm really worried about them winning 
whereas I would like to see them learn a real lesson that no, the country does not want identity politics. I would like them to see, I want them to have a Jeremy Corbyn lesson over here. That would be very, very healthy to the country. And I'm not sure in the long run, which will prove to be more important. You know, it, it, we may not, in your, you know, from speaking from your point, we may, may not survive another four years of Trump. He may be, we argued about this last time, maybe he's the existential threat that we'll never recover from. And so then in that case, that would have to be the, the worst of two evils. On the other hand, we could survive Trump and to see the, the, the next version of the Democratic Party be a little bit more live and let live and a little bit more embracing of the original Martin Luther King dream, um, that, then we might have a future as a country because I don't think the country has a future going in a direction of identity politics. I think we're going to come apart uh, and start really, really in a zero-sum game of fighting each other. We, I'll say one more thing. We are resisting all the things you would see emerge in a naturally healthy society when it comes to race. Naturally, in a society which was blossoming in a healthy way, white people would want to in, in, in wear something that a black person wore, a black person would like to wear the music or something, I'd like to open a Japanese restaurant. This would be what you would naturally see in a healthy society. Right. Instead, we're saying, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna have to constantly educate you on what this meant 100 years ago so that you never do this. And we wanna never see the actual flowering of a healthy society on race. As a matter of fact, we're not even sure, we wanna see white people and black people dating anymore, at least, as a black person, that's my prerogative to say that that really angers me. White people can't say that. And I'm saying, so I would like to see this demolished because I really, I have, I have mixed children. I want, them to, I want them to grow up in a country that doesn't think this way. My, 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 I famously told on this podcast too many times, my daughter came home from the first grade and said, daddy, you're white, right? I'm like, yeah. She goes, do you do evil things? Do you do terrible things? Do you do cruel things? Like, what are you talking about? This is what she's learning in schools. You don't think that, I mean, that, that, that stays with the dad. Like, I don't want these people to win. I, so I don't, you know, I, that's why I'm torn. It's not about uh, Trump. Uh, look, I, identity politics ends up in a lot, of, a, a lot of cases redounding to terrible, terrible, terrible outcomes. And, and that is from left and right. Yep. And it is something that we need to be enormously cautious about. <clears throat> and and I do think there, I, I think the Democrats have a great opportunity to win this election, and if they do things that are that are too driven by either identity politics or or this this you know desire to have a, a, a gigantic suite of policies that they know they can't sell in an ordinary time work, they could lose it all again in two years or four years. You know, this country has always had a kind of political homeostasis in the middle and the the left is never in too much has too much power for too long the right never has too much power for too long and nobody's happy about it everybody's pissed off all the extremes are always pissed off why aren't you in the revolution with bernie why aren't you you know closing down abortion clinics you know with the reverend falwell whatever left and right they all bitch about their own people yeah the and and either way in in four years it's going to be a different person because Joe Biden is not running again, and Trump, if he wants, is, is is out. So, so both parties should be planning for in four years because nobody from both parties like can be, can I think of like can be the next president? Yeah, well, there, there, okay. there there will be a, there there's going to be a really huge battle between the the left and the right in this country um, on both in in the parties. There will be a cataclysmic purity fight in both parties coming up. I wonder, I wonder, you know, as we, you know, as, as we, we move along, I mean, you know, obviously coronavirus is still going to be playing, playing a pretty big part in that not only from us, I hope, learning from mistakes that we made, but also what does opening up look like in the next, you know, few months? What does, you know, sure. the next year look like? And something that I worry about um, is I thought that um, with the coronavirus hitting that, people would be a lot more you know, introspective and work on their relationships and just stuff like that. But it seems like more people have just sort of been spending a lot of time online where they're able to just get pissed off and mad about stuff. Oh yeah. Um, look, look social media is that, great at keeping you pissed off. Yeah. That's yeah. like, you know, separating us even more and, and kind of to, to Noam's point, like diet, like 
doing these deep dives into identity politics where it's not just stuff, it's not just bringing up um, historical stuff. It's also making shit up, like being upset about master bedroom. Meanwhile, the term master bedroom was made in like the 1920s or something like right. that, you know? And um, so, so that's something that, that, that I worry about. And I don't know if there's, you know, any way back from that other than, um, you know, throwing away my, my social media, but. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, I deleted my Facebook account and I never really used it. I never was really like into Facebook, but I deactivated it. And I was like, this is such a relief. Fuck mm. that. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with Rick, Twitter. Rick, yeah. Rick it, it's really, I mean, I don't know if you guys, I, I shouldn't, I don't want to put that to come out wrong. I think it's just, it's, it's hard for strategists to understand how everyday people are feeling. Like I, I did on one of the podcasts, I talked about how I was reading my daughter, my children um, to kill a mockingbird. Why? Because I wanted to teach them about racism. And this was a, a, a classic allegory of racism. You know? And somebody heard this and wrote a column about me calling me a white supremacist and the column. Wait, know, what? Yeah. Be, because I think I know how to teach my children. And I'm like, this is, and it didn't do any damage to me, but it's just, it's painful to, to live in this world. When I hear a story about somebody who gets fired because they quoted the N word in a conversation where they were lamenting how horrible it was that somebody used the N word, that sort of thing, you know, right. where, where if you do a hard Google search of rollingstone.com for N word, for, you know, the actual N word spilled out, spelled right. out, it's like 40, 50 times you can see it spelled out. But then some businessman or the Washington Post exposes this woman who dumbly tried to dress up as Megyn Kelly and, you know, the black face, you know, and a private person. This, like, you just, I, I just, I'm, I'm repeating myself already, but it's very difficult for somebody like me to not see Joe Biden with Kamala Harris as his pick as a very difficult thing to get behind, to pull a trigger for that because he may be gone and she is under the sway of everything that I truly fear and hate and I don't want my kids to ever deal with. And well, so, I, 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 I can't I, I be alone. This, I, I will say this also. Thinking that way. Yeah. There's a difference between being a candidate and having the superb and, and sublime power of the presidency um, and I think the critiques of, of her from the left, you know, all along were that she's tough, she's too authoritarian, she's too this, she's too that. So I, 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 it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and how people look at, um, how people look at the, the realities between the two of them uh, going forward. So, they need a sister soldier moment. That's, they just need some sister soldier moment against wokeness to yeah. make people understand yeah, we do. We, we do see some limit to this. We're we're on yeah. board. We have we share the same priorities, but no, we're not down with crazy. And uh, you know. So so back back to my question, Rico. How many states are in play right now? You think? Uh, right now, you could look at about fourteen or fifteen states that are legitimately in play in this election. Some of which are surprising cases, like, well, look, Florida and Ohio were um, were red states before uh, the beginning of this year that were pretty solidly in Trump's camp. Uh, mm. Those states are both now either quite or somewhat leaning Biden. Michigan was a tie ball game. Biden has had a consistent lead there for about the last five months. Uh, Arizona is a state that should be red and is not red anymore. Um, so North Carolina is in play. Georgia is a tie ball game. Texas is not really in play, but it's a lot closer than it, than it should be in a normal circumstance. So it's kind of crazy. We, we heard Hawaii, too. Somebody in this show said it before. Uh, Hawaii is always going to go Democrat. It's, it's, it's a safe Democratic state. Hey, Rick, do, do you, are, you, are, you, are you racing to go right this second? Can I show you something? I, I, yeah, you can show me something, but I've got to, they've got, they're calling me for my next thing. Okay, this, uh, is, the last, this is the last thing yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to share my screen. So just because I, you probably have something interesting to say about this. I don't know if you can see that on the, your screen there. This was a poll from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Do you think Joe Biden should select a vice president who was white, who was black, or do you think race shouldn't be a factor in selection? So this was amazing to me, even though it's, it's already old news, but just as ha how I think Twitter is the executive editor of everything, blacks, black voters in swing states, 
six percent thought it mattered that they pick a, a a black person and this is what's fascinating very liberal you can see that purple rectangle very liberal 37 percent essentially want a quota system and the least are the very conservatives who doesn't even register they they, they like it doesn't matter what race you are it doesn't matter what race you are and that's quite a that's quite an interesting data point to me well i, I will introduce you to a quick polling concept and then i really do have to to jump um, there's a thing called the socially desirable response in polling. People give the answer you think they think you should give. People will tell you all the time. So if I went out and I said, hey, are you a racist? 99.99999% of people are going to go, hell no, I'm not a racist. Or are you an environmentalist? Or do you spank your kids? Or do you cheat on your spouse? We know those numbers are always at variance with what people tell you when you're polling. And I think there is among, like you said, the very conservatives and Republicans, there's a, there's a reflexive thing of saying, oh, no, it doesn't matter a bit. It doesn't make any difference. Progressives, hard progressives are going to tell you a little more about what's in their hearts, generally speaking. So and what about those black people in the swing states? I, I, I take your point. I think you're, you're just obviously right about that. To some I, I, I would have to look at the sample size yeah. also, but by the yeah. way, because I think yeah. I saw that it was like 1300 voters. And yeah. when you drill down into the subsets, that probably means they interviewed nationally 68 African Americans. So but I'd I, have to, I'd have to break the cells out. Didn't, on that, but didn't no, Biden well, say they all basically the same? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, uh, Rick, Rick, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and your. Lou, to Adam, Noam, thank you guys as always. Great Thanks, conversation. Rick. Really appreciate your thank time you. and uh, you to you talk to you again. You better put back what comes in the 18th. Correct? On the 18th of August, at Running Against the Devil, available everywhere fine books are sold. Thank Thanks, you so guys. Much, appreciate thank you. you. Have a good one. Hey, Lou.